Good afternoon, I'm Joyce Barrett and welcome to our revitalization training. Uh, today's topic is fundraising. This session will be a 90 minute session, 1 to 2.30. And I'd like to welcome Mary Helmer who will be doing the presentation today from Main Street, Alabama. We will be taking questions uh, you, at the end of the thing, at the end of the presentation. So just type your question in at any time and then we will answer those. In the handout box on your panel is the copy of the PowerPoint that Mary's presenting today. If you have any problems with the software, it's best to just log out and log back in. The software GoToWebinar will be sending you a link later today to the recording. So if you want to watch that or share it with somebody else, please do. So I'd like to introduce Mary Helmer. She's the coordinator of the Main Street Alabama program. Alabama currently has 27 designated communities and 32 downtown network communities. Mary spent 10 years as a Main Street director in Emporia, Kansas, and then she moved on and was the coordinator for the Kansas Main Street program for five years. So Mary, we're anxious to hear how we can better fundraise for Main Street. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Joyce, for, for this opportunity. It's always nice to be able to help out another state coordinator. So, and the lovely thing about it is the favors always get returned. So I've got to think what I need out of Joyce when this is all said and done. But uh, I really appreciate uh, being able to do this. And as Joyce said, I was a local Main Street director for 10 years myself. Now here in Alabama, we are a private nonprofit, a little bit different than the Ohio program, I think. Joyce, you correct me on that uh, if, I'm, if I'm wrong. Um, we're a nonprofit too. Oh, score. So there'll be some good stuff in here for, for her as well. But I also worked in state government in Kansas. So I've kind of been through uh, about every different way of figuring out how to get money out of somebody that can possibly happen. So oh, you told me I, I wouldn't have to. There she goes. All right. So the first thing we're going to talk about is where money comes from. I think a lot of times uh communities get stuck on one particular sourcing fund um so i want you to really kind of think some think your way through this a little bit and then think about where those charitable dollars go we'll talk more as we go through about the best way to match your mission with your sourcing fund but 69 percent was given by individuals 17 percent by foundations 10 percent by bequest and five percent was giving by corporations. And this is uh, from giving in the USA. You can look this up. These are two, the 2019 numbers. So there is some growth in, in giving in the US. So giving by individuals totaled an estimated uh, $309 billion with an increase of 4.7%. That's amazing. And I do think this is an area where a lot of Main, local Main Street programs miss, miss the boat. Having that opportunity to have giving by individuals, we'll, we'll get a, dig a little bit deeper into that later. Uh, giving by foundations increased by 2.5% to an estimated 75.69 billion. Just a crazy amount of, of money by foundations. That is where you have to do that mission match. Understanding a foundation may be there, but if what you do is not in their wheelhouse, really focus on the ones you have the best chance of getting funding from. Giving by bequest is another one that a lot of Main Street programs uh, don't always think about, especially, and I've seen this work better, frankly, in smaller communities where you have a benefactor who's, you know, maybe somebody who's been on your board for a long time, they've owned some property, and one of our smallest communities when I was a designated, uh, when I was a director in Kansas, one of our smallest communities got a bequest that still funds that program today from somebody who had been on their board for a very long time and when they passed they bequested their um their funding to the local ministry program and then giving by corporations this is another one that you need to kind of be in the wheelhouse but that is increased by 13 percent in 2019. so i just wanted to to go over this just real briefly to let you know, don't always think that all the money has to come from your city. There are different sources of funding out there. So when you think about how to raise money, the biggest thing that keeps people from achieving their fundraising goals 
are just these these line items here not assigning responsibility it is not just the responsibility of the local main street director it is the responsibility of your board and other volunteers to raise money for your organization but you have to be clear about your needs everybody wants that magic uh letter that you send out and you get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of checks in i'm telling you there isn't one that's the please sir may i have some more money and uh, it just there isn't a letter that just makes people want to send you money so you have to be clear about your needs and understand the importance of your organization so telling your story really important that you deliver on what you promise so underperforming in those specific categories are going to be a big issue too then not developing that overall fundraising plan and really not asking, not taking the time to get out there and ask. So some things you have to do before you start fundraising are having some documentation in place. So what are your articles of incorporation? Are you a C3? Are you a C6? Are you, you know, embedded in a city? Are you embedded within a, you know, tourism office? Whatever yours is, you have to have all of this together so people understand who you are. Obviously, for corporations and foundations, they're wanting to contribute to a 501c3. A lot of my organizations here in Alabama run their local Main Street program, if they're not embedded in the city or tourism or whatever, uh, are a 501c6, so they can do the economic development activities that they want to do and do a membership drive. And then they have a companion 501c3, Friends Of, that they can run uh grants through that is always my recommendation to cities as they come on so they'll need to know what your tax uh, exempt status notification is your 990s your budget who's on your board who can reach out who are your other contributors and think about having a one pager on your organization i actually had a funder here in alabama ask me for that and i'll, I'll be honest i hyperventilated just a little going, what you want like one page to tell you everything we do um, and she goes, yeah, and I want pictures. <laughs> it was like, oh my gosh, kind of blew my mind. And I have an example of what we use here in Alabama. So I would encourage you to think about how you can break that down because we eat, live and breathe it. And sometimes nightmare it all the time. We just want to, you know, throw the kitchen sink at them and we need to, you know, boil it down to something that we can easily leave behind. Uh, you know making sure that they know who your key staff and volunteers are if you have great letters of support uh, important newspaper social media clippings and stories about people that you've served so just kind of have those things pulled together you won't always have to put that in every packet kind of depends on who you're approaching but just like anybody else if for instance here in alabama the power company is southern power southern companies it's always good to know what that what is going on with other com power companies in your region. So, you know, you can have that apples to apples comparison. So here is our sample one pager. Uh, we do it front to back and sometimes we do, we cheat, we do a, a three one pager. So it'll be the pictures on the front that kind of depict what we do and who we are. And then just, this is our brand statement with Main Street Alabama. And then sometimes we'll also enclose a picture that shows the map of where we started with 10 cities and now we have the 20, it's actually 28, 28 designated cities now, we just brought a new one on, uh, and where we're at on the map and what we're doing. So it's very concise, it fits within our brand, and it's easy to as a leave behind. So hopefully I'll get this to play for you guys. The way Alabama goes Thank you. 
So we actually have, Joyce, were you able to see that and hear that okay? Hopefully no, we couldn't hear it, but we got to see it. Oh, no. Okay. I will send you the link. That's so, I haven't quite figured out how to embed, but it's what we did. So I'm not going to play the video again, but basically what she did is she read our brand statement over that lovely video. Um, so, nope, we don't need it again, but it's about a minute, half, two minute video. We also have a five minute one that is, it shows all of our main, well, four of our main street cities and they're talking about the four points. So what it is, is, sometimes it's easier to just send a link to somebody that shows a video. It's not real hard to get that kind of, you know, pictures and videos that are done. You can do that uh, pretty inexpensively now. We actually got a, a grant to help with ours because we were doing it in four different cities. But if you can get something like that done, and Joyce, I'll send you the links to that so people can watch it on their own computers because they're really well done. Um, and it's just a great explanation of what Main Street is and what it does. So I apologize. It's a bummer that you couldn't couldn't hear it. Um, so we're going to go into fundraising 101. And this is where you got, you know, there's just some things you need to understand. What are you selling? So what is your product? Sometimes people just can't wrap their head around the quality of life within a district. So you're going to have to start breaking that out. That's where your Work plans become very helpful as you're pitching your program. And then who has the stake in Main Street? And I'm gonna go through that here in just a minute, but it shouldn't be the same message for every group that you go to. And you should always have peer to peer whenever possible. And then finally, how do you make the pitch? You need to be able to do your research ahead of time and then know who needs to be making the ask and don't just arbitrarily leave money on the table. So just like every other Main Street program, we did what probably you guys do when I was a local director. We had levels and our um, power group at that point, I was at Emporia, Kansas. Uh, it's now West Star Energy. Back in the day, it was uh, Kansas Gas and Electric. I think is what it was back in the day. Um, but what we did is we figured out, okay, every time we turn on, get a building renovated and they turn on the lights, they, they're connecting obviously to the power company. So after I started thinking, oh my gosh, they have been paying $200 a year, just like every small business along Main Street, which they're not a small business. So we figured out how much kilowatt was sold when we were 50% vacant and compared it to the kilowatt sold when we were only 7% vacant. And then we went to them and said, isn't this awesome? And we had this long this conversation with them, oh my gosh, can't believe you've grown that much. Can't believe you have this, can't believe about that. And they go, oh, this is a money meeting. Yeah. Uh, I said, you know, it'd really be great if you could contribute at the $5,000 level, which is a far cry from the 200 they paid for like 10 years. And as we went through the, the kind of the distribution of everything that was going on, they said, okay. So that's when you make that pitch, it's important that you're able to back it up. So there's lots of different types of fundraising. There's the general appeals. Those tend to be the ones that when you're a brand new Main Street program, it's the, we are gonna be great, just wait. Um, those are the, you know, the, where everybody's excited and they're getting involved in the program, but you can't be doing that near four or five or 10. You need to get past that general appeal after a while sponsorships you know that's been so tough on all of our main street programs across the united states this year with covid because we haven't been able to have the sponsorships that we typically have with our big events which has been, been difficult but think of other ways that they can sponsor perhaps a um, how are we going to do a entrepreneurial program and they can sponsor that so it doesn't always have to be big events or activities and also know that when you're making the ask, there are some corporations who will sponsor things through their marketing budget that won't give you money through their philanthropic budget because they just, that goes out the door quickly, but they have a much bigger marketing budget. So you need to really be examining how you might be able to get, instead of the $200 membership we were getting from our power company, to the $5,000 
sponsorship that we got from them each year. Then there's the annual membership campaigns. If you are a 501c3 sole organization, that's your, you don't have another opportunity, you're probably going to have to just be a little careful on uh, your language. If you're doing a membership drive, you need to call it investors or donors and you just don't want to mess up your 501c3 status by having a membership campaign as a 501c3. Just a little bit difference in the language. As a C6, you're fully open to do a membership campaign. As you become more um, savvy in your fundraising, you can be looking at special assessment districts, BID, business improvement districts, CIDs, uh, uh, commercial, community de and initiated development. Those types of things are all things you can look at. That is something I'm going to have to have you guys really refer back to Joyce. I'm not as familiar with the what you have available in Ohio as I am obviously here in Alabama. Um, endowments and private foundations are also ones to be thinking about. Private foundations will typically be the ones that uh, won't fund on a statewide level, but they'll fund a project or an event or an activity within a community that they have some connectivity to. So don't don't forget about those endowments and, and private foundations. Obviously, the public sector, your city, should always be a part of your funding. The old rule, school of thumb, was 30% public. That would be your city and or county. 30% um, within the district itself, the people that you're serving. 30% outside of the district, which would be industry, manufacturing, private foundations, and only 10% events. Now, nobody has that perfect you know, 30, 30, 30, 10 rule, but it is a good idea for you to be thinking outside of just the public sector box. Because when things happen like, uh, you know, there's a downturn in the economy, that public sector is not always the most reliable source of funding. Think about events. Hopefully, we'll be able to get back to those next year. Um, some communities, I've seen them look at earned income in Leavenworth, Kansas. They actually purchased a two story building, the Main Street program did. They renovated the bottom level for an incubator on the front side, their office on the back side, and then apartments up above. So they were walking the walk. And they were able to pay off the mortgage by the income they were getting upstairs and then were able to eventually make money for the organization. So that's not for the faint of heart. That is for a program that's more advanced. And every once in a while, I've seen some communities actually contract with either their city or other organizations for particular services like um, when we did our streetscape project in Emporia we ended up with we're a town of about 25,000 people the we had 50 five zero little pocket gardens they were beautiful still beautiful to this day but I think the city realized after it was done like holy cow somebody's got to manage all of that so we were able to contract with the city outside of what we received in our appropriation to take care of that so there's opportunities for that so when you get started, you have to figure out what your needs are. And the way you do that is look at your overhead. So what does it cost to pay your director? If you have an office that's not already donated or if it's in kind, you need to figure all that in. Um, what do we need for our work line items and each of our work plans? And that's where you come up with your overall budget. So you need the work plans become more and more important from a budgeting perspective as you move forward and it really does help you tell a great story when you're talking to funders and they go but i just don't want to pay your salary well no we're doing all of this so it's able to really help you uh, articulate the needs wh why you need the money to begin with map your strategy figure out how you're going to do it for us back in back in my local main street director days we did our membership drive with our businesses at a time that was separate when the chamber was doing theirs because we didn't want to compete. We didn't want to have them mad at us or us mad at them. So we completely separated that. But I did not do my, um, we called them citizen supporters. I didn't do that with our business memberships because there was a little confusion on the citizen supporter was only $35, but a business membership was 150. And I had some businesses go, well, I want to pay 35. Well, okay, we're not doing this all at the same time. <laughs> so it learned, we learned quickly to shift that and not have it at the same time. Train your volunteers, let them know you can't be the only one. 
you have to be able to train them and say, okay, this is what we're doing. This is our goal. These are the businesses we need to reach. Who do you want to connect with? Implement that strategy. Always make sure you thank the contributors. And the big thing is to stay in contact with them. The worst thing you can do is to only contact them once a year and that's when you need money again. So you want to stay in contact with them as you move forward. So this is really where most people go, okay, I got all that, but how in the world do I do it? The first thing you need to do is make an investment yourself. There's nothing harder than to go to somebody and you're asking them for money and they look at you and go, well, do you give? And that means individually as a director. Um, when I hire staff here with Main Street Alabama, one of the first things we do after we get all of the hiring stuff out of the way is they get a pledge form. <laughs> and I, I give to my organization every year too, even if it's $25, because uh, I, believe me, run a nonprofit, I understand, especially on the local level, you don't have a lot of money, but you have to make that investment yourself. You have to know the campaign and the prospects. So that one size fits all mentality that we all seem to have with that, I'm just gonna mail out a letter and I'm gonna get all these checks back and it's gonna be awesome, doesn't work. So you have to know who the people are and how you're going to approach them. Need to make a personal appointment and people don't like to ask for money. So you're gonna to have to take somebody along that's peer to peer so you can have that conversation. If you have your work plans done, you can easily present your needs and relate that personal viewpoint because you have all of that in place. So they, they can know very clearly what your work plans are. And then request the amount. And again, not everybody needs to give the exact same amount. So you're gonna to have to do some research ahead of time. My mistake was asking the power company to give it a certain level that everybody else was giving and then really realizing later on they can afford a whole lot more. This was silly, I should have thought about this differently. Counter their objections and we're gonna go through that. And then close. So keeping them involved includes periodic calls, letters, inviting them to a special event. We actually had, uh, down here at the bottom, ask a, a host to, uh, to host a small gathering of top supporters. We had a funeral director in my town when I was a local director who gave the best Christmas parties ever. And we asked him if he would host you know, this kind of special party. And it was it was the party everybody wanted to get into. And he goes, yeah, I'll do that. But in order to get into this, his, you had to be at this, at the top level, what we called our benefactor level. And I know it sounds goofy, but people would jump up a level so that they could be a part of that group. It really worked well. You'll be surprised um, how that relationship building part keeps everything going when it comes to fundraising. Send the handwritten notes, send out annual reports, brochures, newsletters, don't overwhelm them, but you should be in contact with the prospect or donor at least four times a year. Um, ask them to be a speaker or a mentor, send them a birthday card or holiday, uh, feature them in publications. They may be asked to serve on an advisory board or advice on a special project or program, and then I've already mentioned the small gathering of top supporters. So let's talk a little bit about your annual fundraising. So your annual fund is that foundation. It's, it's kind of that, when I talked to my resource development committee here with Main Street Alabama, I said, we've got meat and potatoes and we have gravy. Gravy's nice, but we live on meat and potatoes. I am from the Midwest, so it was meat, I should say shrimp and grits down here, I guess. But it's so important that you have that regular annual fund that you know you can depend on. And if you get a government grant on top of that, that's lovely, but you do not live on grants alone. So that annual fund is so important. Uh, it's a source of unrestricted income that's used for overhead. Um, it can be used for salaries, it can be used for rent, it can be used for things that a lot of grants won't pay for. And the annual fund helps identify future leaders for the organization and donors who might upgrade their donations over time. So the benefits are it's typically renewable, it's that kind of annual membership piece, that annual giving from the city, uh, gains higher visibility, it can attract your energetic volunteers. And what we did is in our board policies, not in our bylaws, but in our board policies and procedures, 
we actually had a policy in that that every board member was to bring on an additional volunteer annually. That was a part of what we did when I was a local Main Street director. So I had 11 board members and I knew I would get 11 additional volunteers every year. Now that volunteer may be somebody who helped us do, you know, a downtown cleanup and then we never saw them again. Or they may be one that, okay, I'm gonna work every special event because this is fun. Or they sometimes turned into board members. So it just, you know, understand that's a good way to get other volunteers in so it's not, not always on you as a local Main Street director. And then offer staff the kind of stability you need to work to your greatest ability because you cannot, been there, done that, I was a director for 10 years, you cannot do everything by yourself. So here are some steps for a successful annual campaign. So the first is to plan, is determine where the sources are gonna come from. So you really need to look at your different buckets and where those sources are gonna come from and how you're going to incorporate that into your overall drive. A lot of times a local program will overly rely on one source of funding and then they freak out when that source of funding goes away because everyone will go away. We just got a letter today that surprised me from a donor that's provided $5,000 a year for the last eight years for us that's saying, I haven't had the best year in the stock market this year. I'm gonna have to wait to sign my pledge form for next year. And that was a surprise to me uh, because this is someone who is kind of a founder of our program. But I also know that I'm filling the funnel from the other side and I'm not worried about that particular piece. So you always have to be thinking about how you're filling the funnel on the other side. So that would be memberships, grants, special events, corporate sponsorships. Um, I also do some consulting on the side. And I remember going to uh, Springfield, Illinois one year to talk to them about organizational, you know, how do you, how do you set up your organization long term? And they were in trouble from a fundraising perspective because they'd done a really huge event that had funded them 100% for a long time. And guess what happened? They had bad weather for two years in a row and they had no money. Um, now you're in Ohio and I know it snows there. So uh, you can't always count on special events to last the test of time, nor to always have good events um, or, or good, good weather for events too. And sometimes that will affect your sponsorships too. So when you think about sponsorships, how are you gonna use those outside of just special events? And then analyze those funding sources for their reliability. Do they have political ramifications? Uh, I know we've had, uh, we had one particular group reach out to us uh, that wanted to provide some funding, which was great, but they were a, an organization that provided funding for businesses that couldn't get funding any other way. I mean, kind of like one step above a loan shark. And, but they wanted our brand on everything. And we said, no, we're not gonna do that. So we, we passed on that particular funding because it wasn't gonna have good political ramifications for us in the long run. So think about that. Set your goal for your drive, taking care not to let only income or budget shortfall determine your goal, and then set the goal and range for each funding source and move forward. So that's the planning process. Step two is to organize, <clears throat> determine the type of campaign you need for each funding source. For a membership drive, that's very different than how you're gonna go out for sponsorships. And that's even different from how you're going to approach your city for your annual um, allocation. So you need to figure out what's the campaign for each of those. How many committees are needed? Name your committee chairs and estimate how much staff support is needed. Pull all of that get into a comprehensive annual funds plan uh, and put it into your work plans. Step three, write your case statement, documenting your organization's annual needs, put together a marketing plan, and like I said, we have our brand statement that uh, when you get your handouts, you'll be able to click on that, and read our brand statement a little more clearly. Then you implement. You develop and identify the leadership for the fundraising program, a calendar with clear deadlines. I don't know about you guys, but if, it, if my phone doesn't tell me you got a meeting coming up, um, it needs to be on my calendar. I have a lovely credenza. I'm actually in the office today that has all kinds of stuff piled on it. And that's where things go that don't have deadlines. There's a lot of stuff back there. I wish there wasn't quite so much, but deadlines come first. So if you don't have it on the calendar with clear deadlines, that's gonna be a problem. And then look at your fundraising prospect list. You don't always go to the usual suspects, think outside of that 
because uh, you always want to fill that funnel. And then evaluate. How does an organization know when it's, know when it's doing a good job and it's being responsible? Uh, sometimes you only rely on the internal, but you need to have some mechanisms in place to gather that input from outside. And some ways to do that internally or that annual board retreat. Um, have a nominating committee that reviews and screens so you know what's going on. Uh, new board and committee member orientation, you can get that internal feedback there. Quarterly assessments, individual meetings between the board chair and or Main Street director with key board members, volunteers and staff. Um, I try very hard to have an individual breakfast, lunch and lately Zoom meeting with all of our board members instead of having just when we meet as a board and I because it's really hard to get to know people that way. Take your time if you're on here and your local Main Street director, take that time to have a one on one meeting with each of your board members. And external, you can do the donor surveys, have interviews and focus groups and look at your published studies and frankly, look at what cities around you are doing, but also look at what they're doing across the nation because you can get some really great ideas from other states or other regions. And the biggest thing is don't make promises that you can't keep. Uh, annual campaigns, membership drives, in-kind agreements. The most important thing is if you say you're going to do a project that year with their funds, you better do it. Uh, and that's why, again, Main Street is that program that typically the implementation side of things is what makes us different. It's, you know, having that report, isn't this a great study and we need this study and gosh, we got this study done and the study goes on the shelf and five years later, somebody else says, you know what we need? We need a study. Now, Main Street doesn't do that. We, we put it on a work plan and we get things done. So that helps you become a more efficient fundraising uh, machine when you make sure that this is what we said we we're going to do. This is where we're at six months later. This is where we're at in a year. We got that done and now we're coming back to you for what we're going to do the following year. So the big thing you need to be able to answer to your donors is what's in it for them. So when I was a local Main Street director, I went to the, um, they call it Main Street America Institute now, but back then it was certified Main Street manager, CMSM training. And that's where I came across this, how to sell, sell Main Street to different constituent groups. I've never figured out who came up with this, but they're brilliant. So I don't want to take credit for something that's not mine. I got it back then, but there's never a name on it, but it's completely awesome. So I want to go through that with you guys. This how to sell Main Street to different constituent groups is helping you start to break down what does it mean for a utility company so when you're writing that please sir may i have some more letter that we all like to do utility company this is why i'd like some more every time we open up a new business those additional businesses use those utilities the longer business hours means they're paying you know they're buying more electricity healthy businesses increase the usage healthy economy causes the community to grow and improves their corporate image so you need to take these this verbiage and tie it into your your letter, of course, but also when you go to meet with the utility company. And like I said, I took it one step further by figuring out the kilowatt usage at this point, the kilowatt usage here going, holy, holy shimolikins, this is great. I'm going to be able to really say, hey, we're better and this is why. When you're going to your city. Um, to ask for, for funding. And I've had a couple of my, my local programs here in Alabama use their economic impact numbers to go to their city to make their, uh, I used to call it the dog and pony show back in the day, um, to just say, hey city, this is what we do and this is why we do it. And here are my economic impact numbers. They not only were able to retain what they had been receiving, but they received an increase. So when you tie some of this in, it can mean an increased tax base more tourism, increased property values, increased number of jobs, a healthy economy, better services available, better relationships. A lot of time a local Main Street program director will be the liaison between the city and businesses. Um, increased volunteer base for the city, impetus for public improvement dollars, CDBG funds, and more grant availability. The next one is county. They're a harder nut to crack um, in, in my experience, but this can also be areas to go and visit with them, improve public relations, a good partnership, 
county and community pride, quality of life issues, does allow you to attract larger corporations and industry when you have that quality of life within your local Main Street program. Preservationists, there's always these people out there, I just want to talk about historic preservation. Well, there's a category for them too. Reinforces that common goal of preservation, enlarges the whole coalition, because we know that Main Street is a big believer in historic preservation, but we're also a big believer in economic development. So it's important that we're able to work both of those into the conversation. Increased awareness and credibility, education on preservation issues, and of course, tie between preservation and economic development. This is where we're getting into the meat of things for what most communities do in their membership drive, because this is what you're gonna have for your retail and business owners. So for them, it's increased sales, improved image, creates new markets, increased value of the business life, quality of the business life. A lot of your local programs will have incentive programs or access to incentive programs, and you don't have to own all of those. You can package those two. Uh, business assistance programs, district marketing strategies, a better business mix, and help stop sales leakage. Financial institutions, it satisfies the Community Reinvestment Act. If you have not gone out and done a search on all of your communities, and you can do it, Joyce, if you guys don't have this, let me know and I'll send it to you to send out. There is a website that you can go to and type in a particular city and find out if you're meeting CRA standards, because that's when you go to a bank, instead of saying, hey, can you give me $300 membership? You go in and say, okay, I'm helping you meet your CRA. Here's the stats to back that up. We need 5,000. Um, potential for loans and deposits, improved image and goodwill, and survival of the community bank is critical. Survival of the community is critical to the bank and, and economic stability. And I'm gonna, Okay, I'm gonna talk about property owners and then I'm gonna go back to local residents and consumers. So property owners, sometimes you have a property owner who doesn't own the business. So this would give you an opportunity to talk to just property owners. That increased occupancy, rent stability or increase, increased values, reduced vandalism and crime, incentive, assistance with incentives and new uses, particularly on the upper floors. Now, when I went to the certified Main Street Manager training a long time ago when everything was held in DC, this one right here, this local residents and consumers was the one that I went, Oof, just blew my mind. Never thought about local residents and consumers as an opportunity for funding. So we came back and we put together what we call our citizen supporter campaign and we settled on 35 bucks. And we were, we were a town of 25,000 people. We thought we're gonna get a hundred of these. And we thought that would be pretty sweet if we were able to get, you know, $3,500 would be great. So we put together our, our information and, and listen guys, this is before there was a ton of social media. We, it was more one-on-one -on -one than it was, uh, you know, sending something out. But every board member took this to five of their friends and then they we asked them to kind of spread it out. So what we put together was this cute little postcard thing that says, this is why you should be involved. You know, it's enhanced marketplace, a sense of pride. You get to know more about social and cultural activities. It can help you keep your kids in town, historical awareness. Your tax dollars stay here instead of going somewhere else. You get the opportunity to participate, better communication, advocacy, and home values increase. Now, if you look through this, I'm not writing anybody a check. I'm not sending them a coupon. A coupon. Um, all of that is, you know, this is none of this is going to cost you money. It's all about that quality of life and sense of pride. We, we ended up getting, we were shooting for a hundred. We ended up getting a thousand. If you're doing the math in your head, yes, that's $35,000 like that. So don't forget this local residents and consumer piece that a lot of people tend to like, no, I got to get all my businesses. Yes, that is important and you shouldn't forget that. But this is low hanging fruit that a lot of Main Street communities have not even begun to tap. Uh, frankly, I'm still a member of the local program in Emporia because I was director there for ever and a day. And their uh, fee is six, $65 a year now. If they're still getting a thousand people or more, <laughs> look what that does for your budget. 
So highly encourage you to use this when you when you go through your membership drive. But you're still going to have those people says, I don't want to give you any money. How do you deal with that? So this is where we have the objections. A lot of times is, I don't think we need that project. I don't think we should renovate the theater. I don't think we should have a streetscape or whatever it might be. That is your opportunity to teach them about the needs in the community or switch. Okay, if you don't like the theater, what about this project? So the focus of the program is one. Another one is timing of the contribution. I just can't afford it right now, or I need to check with my spouse. Um, suggest a better time. Could could you do this quarterly? Um, could I, you know, would it be better if we did it, you don't have to write me a check, but you know, we can do a direct deposit or a draft or those types of things. I will tell you guys, I was the queen of this with my alma mater, Emporia State University, when they started connecting with me about making a donation to the university. I have two sons, both of my boys went to Emporia State University. So when they first started calling me, I was the local Main Street director head of a nonprofit, and they were wanting money from me. I'm going, yeah, you got my kids, you got all my money. I don't have any more money. Uh, so they paid attention to that. And when my youngest son, Adam, graduated, they sent me a note saying, we're so pleased that Jacob is my oldest, oldest, and then Adam have graduated from Poria State University. You must be so proud. Uh, can we count on you for a donation? And I'm like, oh, you're so brilliant. Because I didn't have that, I can't do it because I got kids in school anymore. So do they get money out of me? Yeah. Yeah, they do. Um, size, example, that's more than I can give. And then you explain the costs associated with that particular improvement or project. And But you don't want to shoot too low. You'd rather shoot high and be ready to ask for a smaller amount if they, if they want to do something a little smaller. Another one is the uses of money. Uh, again, I don't want to focus, I don't want to fund that project. It's simpler, similar to focus, but they don't want to be associated with that particular project or event, so try to find something different. Uh, administration, this is huge. How do I know you're going to do what you say you'll do? Uh, and that's the opportunity to let people know the things your organization has accomplished. And if you're new, this is the community leaders who are involved. So some of this, if you're a brand new community, is going to be, we're going to be awesome and everybody's excited. But, you know, five years down the road, you'd have to say, we told you we were going to be awesome and we are awesome and this is why. And then stewardship, that is where uh, an objection can be an opportunity to find a new project for volunteer uh, in addition to money. So listen to their comments and if possible, offer them an opportunity to allow them to make their ideas a reality. So we're gonna get a little bit into explaining more about different sources of funding at this point, I'm making good time here. So memberships is the one I've kind of talked about already. This is one that most uh, local Main Street programs uh, rely on fairly heavily. Um, some of them, you know, have 25% or less for, when I was a local Main Street director, it's probably a little closer to 33% of our overall budget every year. So um, that's an excellent way to build that broad-based support, but you have to make sure that it's not the only funding mechanism. Uh, so you can do district business memberships, private individuals, other nonprofits, or businesses outside of the district. And as I mentioned before, 501c3 can include membership associations if the purpose is to advance the profession with respect to educational opportunities. So don't, don't overly rely on just calling it a membership. It has to be pretty much philanthrop philanthropic or educational. Next one is grants. We're gonna talk about a few different grants here. I got one. Two more, nope, one more. So federal grants, um, <laughs> it's rare to obtain them as a part of an annual campaign. This is the gravy that I was talking about earlier. You gotta always count on that meat and potatoes and they almost always are gonna be very specifically related to a project or an activity, uh, like a big streetscape project or funding for a um, water main, those types of things. CDBG is the same way, Community Development Block Grant. They're used for public improvement projects, planning and housing rehab. Um, though I will tell you here in Alabama this last year, we did have one of our smaller communities get a $450,000 CDBG grant to do downtown redevelopment, which is allowable under CDBG, but they don't do it that often. 
So I was going to score. You have opened up the door. Main Street, Alabama is going to be kicking that puppy down. So it's very important that we look at different ways to do that. It is allowable. Um, and again, Joyce, after this, if you'd like more information on that, I'd be happy to, to send it off to you. SHPO's, your State Historic Preservation Office, uh, they have a, are required to have a certain percentage of their federal pass-through funds each year for certified local governments. So if you're not a CLG, um, you need to be working on becoming a CLG because uh, they can help prepare nominations for the National Register of Historic Places. Arts and Humanities, here in Alabama, the Arts and Humanities is a pretty darn good source of, of funding for murals and photography. We actually went to the State Council on the Arts and got our downtown design guidelines that we use for all of our communities paid for. So you never really know what yours is going to fund. Do a little bit of research on that. And then don't overlook your local foundations. Um, we had one in my town uh, where we were able to go to them for $30,000 a year for um, a grant to help new business, entrepreneurial grant. So $10,000. That's how you feel a 50% vacancy, by the way, <laughs> is you work at it every year really hard. But we were able to go to them and, and appeal to them, you know, hey, these, these entrepreneurs need money. If we take them through this whole class and teach them how do you run a small business, how do you, you know, so they have to go through business classes. They already have the excitement of, a, of an you know, entrepreneur and that drive. You need to fill the other leg of the stool, which was a little bit of funding to get them started. And, and they funded for, for several years, uh, helping us get the downtown businesses uh, filled. Uh, there's not one grant funding source uh, that's universal. So check and see if your state has something similar. We have the guide to Alabama grant makers here. Um, there's some other helpful sources, Grant Station, GuideStar. Grant Gopher is a, a new one that came to my attention. I don't think it's on the handout, so I think I just added this on there the other day. Uh, it's like nine dollars a month. It's something we're we are researching um, to to you know be a part of that to see if you know nine dollars a month isn't much, uh, but it, it, we should be able to provide things for our communities as well, foundation center as well. And check and see if your congressman publishes a monthly guide to grants. Terry Sewell, who is our um, uh, is a representative at the congressional level does that for us here in Alabama. So she has a monthly guide to grants that she she sends out that I forward out to all of our cities every every uh, every month. Some other sources of funding or your city support. That's that local public sector. It's usually something that a lot of cities rely on, uh, sometimes overly rely on. So it's that partnership and commitment to the revitalization effort. Uh, they commit revenues from their general funds. Um, they're usually required to complete compete every year within the municipal budget process. Uh, may not be reliable in the long run because if you have here in Alabama and a lot of my communities, we have the strong mayor form of government. So if your mayor changes out and they had a bitter contest with the mayor before them, sometimes we really have to spend some time on advocacy. So it's always good to not choose choose a um, a political candidate when you're going through that in your own community because. If your guy don't win, it could get really crazy. So be very careful on that. Um, some local governments might be willing to approve multi-year funding, but most of them have to go through the budget process every year. I called it our dog and pony show. We went through it annually. And they released, we, they, in, in Emporia, they released it to us in a lump sum, but others do it in phases or even reimbursing. So you'll have to kind of look and see what, what that means for you guys. Um, the next one is special events. Uh, they can generate a lot of money uh, where you have sponsors contributions, registration fees, food and beverage concessions. Um, but relying on a special event can really become um, problematic if something happens with the weather or suddenly the event is no longer or, or we have a pandemic and nobody can go to an event. And it's just not, you know, the place where people want to go anymore. So you need to be clear about the purpose of that. Is it to raise money or to promote downtown or the downtown organization? Uh, no one special event should produce more than 25% of the organization's annual operating budget. Because again, if bad weather or disaster strikes, the impact of lost revenue could be devastating and close your program down. Uh, and it usually takes years to build a special event capable of generating that kind of income. 
So, you know, first couple of years of a special event, you're probably gonna have to underwrite most of those costs. So as you become more mature and the event becomes more established, more likely it is you're gonna get the sponsorship dollars, registration fees, and but it does take time. Uh, and they lose appeal over time. So sometimes you'll have to add something significantly different to it each year. Or in some cases, you really need to look at it and go, you know, this one's run its course. So before it runs its course completely, what are you gonna to do to replace that? Make sure it's uh, clearly connected to and consistent with your local Main Street program's mission. And depending on the special event, it's likely that the donors will derive some material benefit. And that's where you need to be a little bit careful about calling it a membership drive if you're a 501c3, because that can get you in, in trouble <laughs> uh, for your 501c3. That's why we usually advocate to run the organization through a C6. So before I get into advanced fundraising, Joyce, are there any questions? Because it'll, it'll confuse people a bit, I think, if we go into this next part. Okay, do folks want to write some questions in? I uh, just want to remind people there are just minor differences between uh, state jurisdictions. And uh, in Ohio, property tax is enjoyed by the county. The sales ah. tax is usually the county, the state, and sometimes the city. Not every city has a sales tax, but some do. So when you're presenting, make sure you understand where their revenues are coming from for okay. which jurisdiction you're talking to here in Ohio. Yes. Anybody else want to write a question in right now? Uh, generally, we do not have very inquisitive people on our webinars, but why okay. do you keep going, Mary? I'll keep going. Um, it's just this is more advanced. So if you've got if you have programs on here, Joyce, who are fairly new, some of this is going to make their head explode. But what I've gone over prior to this is it's fairly standard fundraising. Um, now we're going to kick into those of you who are going, yep, I'm brave. I can do more. So if you, you can look at, uh, special taxing districts, usually they're called business improvement districts or every, every state has different acronyms for, for their, their stuff. Um, so we're, a, we're SID special improvement district here in Ohio. Okay. Okay, uh, so they, you know, they are a good source of, of funding, um, depending on the size cities. I'll be honest with you, I think most of the time we have people who, bigger cities seem to be able to, they just accept it more readily. So here in Birmingham, they definitely are able to do a BID, but in our littler cities, they struggle a little bit with this. So if you're if you're under and my, my town was 25,000, so it wasn't a little tiny city, but they um, started out with a BID business improvement district, and it got one merchant was unhappy camper. I know we only always have one, but she was unhappy enough that she went around and got 50%, 51% of the merchants within the district to sign a petition to get rid of the BID, and by golly, she got it done. Um, so it's not always a uh, it's not always you know a real dependable source of income so be a little careful about that uh, like i said in, in most cases it works better in more uh, urban areas than in littler ones tax increment financing is one that we're starting to see a few more of our communities pull into but tax increment financing is something that takes time to set up um, the local government can establish a particular district and any increases in the property tax can use be used in the district for which they came. So I was working on a project in Emporia where we called it CID, Community Improvement District, but same, same like a TIF. And it was going to be on a particular district where they were taking an old high school into a hotel and convention center. So in that particular one, it was going to be um, not property tax, but sales tax. So the sales tax is going to be a little bit more on that property. It could be used back on that property to pay off some of the, the bonds. So it's it's that's not a real easy one to do, but it is something for you to think about, again, as a more mature program. Improvement districts are usually set up to implement parking, infrastructure, streetscape, 
uh, depending on the project, they issue a bond and it basically pays the bond off. So it's not always money for the local Main Street program. Tourism tax, though, is something that um, if you are having people come to your community because of what you offer within your district, which is the quality of life or um, different tourism activities, it might not be a bad idea for you to be looking at a little piece of that pie. Uh, so a lot of times it's collected by the city or an independent board. That's ho taxes on hotel lodging rooms and in some cases on restaurants, uh, food and beverage sales. A lot of times we were able to get a, a particular amount of funding from our tourism department for an event or activity that was going to put heads in beds. But uh, something to think about there too for you guys to, to look at. Don't, don't overlook tourism tax. Capital campaigns. This is where you're really looking at a large project that is usually construct a new building or renovate a building or public infrastructure, uh, those types of things. When, when I was a local Main Street director, we did a capital campaign for the Granada Theater. Uh, and it was a six or seven million dollar project that took us a couple of years to raise the funding for. But that ended up being the cornerstone of a lot of bigger development within our district. But it was a one time you know, ask for a lot of different different folks for that particular project. So tread carefully um, when you're looking at capital campaigns, those types of things, you can usually entice donors. I know we were doing the Granada Theater, the number of people that had memories of it being the place where they had their first date or where their parents met and they ended up getting married and that's why I'm here. I mean, there's so many sweet stories of, of how people met and what this theater had meant to the community over the years and how sad they were when it closed and how they're gonna be able to open it back up again, that we we're able to get some money into it because that, that tangible asset, um, those people didn't always turn into regular donors. For the organization so it's generally not the, the nonprofit has to be established because your annual operating budget is not going to be enhanced generally by a capital campaign just be a little careful there so if you are going to undertake a capital campaign there has to be a clear and compelling need a base of donors that is ready and willing to give amounts that are significantly higher than their annual contributions to the organization so if they to $200 a year, but you have a theater renovation project and they want their name on the wall of fame, uh, that may end up being a $5,000 donation, but you're probably not gonna get that every year. So think through that. And test the waters thoroughly and be almost certain the capital campaign will be successful before it's begun. Because trying to raise money like that and then fail leaves a sour taste for the organization itself. Endowment funds are pretty interesting. Again, this is more for a longer term organization, but an endowment is uh, ongoing financial support for the organization through the interest earned on a relatively large amount of money invested for a long period of time. Uh, so you'll see people giving to the uh, community foundation of, and basically there, it allows them to park their money and get some tax incentives for that and what's given out is basically the interest on that money so it's not like you're getting a hundred thousand dollar gift you're getting the interest on it so something something to think about but and i only have one community that's looked at an endowment fund here in alabama they can be difficult because uh, it's hard to raise money uh most difficult to raise because the money is usually not used to meet an immediate need. You're just putting it, you're plugging it away until there's enough interest built in on it. It can be raised by a mature, well-established program. A uh, number of colleges and universities, this is kind of interesting, now encourage their alumni to purchase life insurance policy, naming that institution as their beneficiary. So when the donor eventually dies, the institution collects that large sum of money, and that's usually invested in the endowment. For those of you who can tug at the heartstrings of some of your donors, um, I have seen a couple of our communities be the beneficiary of life insurance policies as well. Um, it's a long-term funding option, uh, one that's only appropriate for an organization that tends to be around a long time. Uh, endowment funds are often given by someone who's already a donor and is very committed to the organization. But I think this is something we can all start to look at. Another option is Organizations have earned interest income without building a permanent endowment 
by asking the donor to give the organization the use of their funds for several years. So the donor retains ownership of the capital, but the nonprofit earns the interest on it. Um, I was talking to you earlier about the um, private foundation in, in Emporia who helped, they gave us 30,000 a year to help our entrepreneurial development grant. And they called me one time when we were, we were in another city doing a Main Street training. And the, the um, head of the foundation goes, okay, we're at the end of our tax year and we have, gosh, I think it was $25,000 that we need to spend do you have a use for it? Yeah, I <laughs> got a use for it. So it was just, it was so cool because we had that relationship with, with them on the entrepreneur development part. They, when they were looking at, you know, Main Street has done what they said they're gonna do. They've built it up. We've gone from 50% vacancy. Now we're at 18%, I think at that point. Uh, these people do what they say they're gonna do. So we're gonna reach out to them to use these funds really great opportunity for us so but that this is why this is advanced fundraising that takes a lot of relationship building you really have to know you can't just walk up to warren buffett and say hey can you give me the interest on your money if he does let me know that would be awesome some fundraising cautions uh no matter how sophisticated or mature main street programs almost always run into organizational problems with their fundraising at some point and the most common problems tend to be sticking to the mission. It's, you, know, you gotta implement the mission of the program. And because Main Street is the organization in most communities that does things, they can get pulled at and yanked at and pushed in different directions than they should be. So implement the mission. A lot of times they have a hard time saying no because they're getting things done and they don't want to um, have a donor that's been so loyal to them tell them I, I can't do that because it's outside my purview. Uh, realistically look at your resources, you know, what are the people, money, programs, and decide what you can and cannot do. Like I said earlier, when we had the, the organization reach out to us from, from a loan fund and they were going to give us a hefty sum of money, but we went politically that's bad for us and it would be bad for our program. So you have to think about all of those um, things when you're looking at fundraising. Fundraising is where the typical conflicts between the roles of the staff and the board occur. <laughs> it has to be accomplished by the board, not just the Main Street director. The worst thing that can happen is if the only person raising the money gets a job somewhere else, that goes with that person. So it's so important that you really realize that it can't be just about the local Main Street director, but the board has to be involved. The staff's role needs to be really pulled together clearly in fundraising. So they are doers to enablers. So you don't have to be the only one that does everything. So those are just some cautions as you move through the process. So some, I'm gonna get through this fast with no questions, we'll see if anybody has after this. Um, over the years, I have done this, uh, you know, pulled information from the National Main Street Center. They have really great information. Learning how to move from a state coordinating program that was located within state government to a state coordinating program that's nonprofit has been wildly eye-opening to me and looking at the sources of funding. So the sources of funding for us are, we do get an allocation from the state, we do get some money through tourism. Most of our funding comes through corporations or foundations who are keenly interested in the quality of life of Alabama long-term. And then we have uh, grants. So, but the grants again are ones like, for instance, I was telling Joyce before you all got on, it looks like we're gonna be able to receive the EDA grant the, at the federal level, which is fantastic for us, but it is a, um, reimbursement only grant. So when that's another funding caution for you guys, it's fantastic to think we're going to get that kind of money, but I have to have the money in play already to do the project and then get reimbursed for it. So just be, be careful when you're looking through that. Of course, I've been teaching this for a long time through uh, my consulting that I don't have a lot of time to do anymore, but I do it from time to time. And when I was in Emporia, I was on the Granada Theater Board. And if you have that opportunity 
to serve on another organization's fundraising, especially capital campaigns, you will learn so much. I learned more about fundraising when I was on the Granada Theater Board than anywhere else, bar, bar none. You know, understanding how do you organize this, understanding the buckets, understanding that you had to not to be afraid to ask people for money. That was where I learned that, you know, when somebody says no, typically that just means I need to work a little bit harder to educate them on who we are and what we do. Where before somebody said no, I would take them off my list forever. I don't do that at all anymore. And to make sure that you take the time to match your source, your funding source, and you do your research to mission match so you understand they, they are interested in what you do, then you need to do a little bit of research and find out what's their capacity. We spend so much time just saying, we're gonna have a membership level and our top level is $300. Well, your power companies shouldn't be doing $300. They should be doing more. They get more benefit. That's why I really wanna spend a little time with you guys on the how to sell Main Street to different constituent groups. And then of course, I was a local program director for 10 years. So you learn very quickly uh, as a local program director that you're always, you always have to be on and you always have to be prepared to answer the questions as to why your program is important and, and learn not to be upset when people don't always understand why you are so excited about what you do because there's so many different other causes out there. I had to get over getting my feelings hurt um, and just go, okay, that one didn't work, but tomorrow's will. And then of course, the school of hard knocks and fundraising fiascos, goodness gracious, I've done a lot of those over the years. So every, every no is an opportunity for you to learn and every no could get you one step closer to yes. I think the last thing before we turn it over for questions uh, that I'd like to say, Joyce, is when you have board members helping you come up with, because I'm looking at all the stuff around my office, because we just had a resource development committee meeting not long ago, and they throw out all these names. And we had one particular board member who would continue to throw out one foundation. And we're going, I don't think that foundation is going to fund us. So we actually did a little research. You can look up almost every, well, you, not every, if the if you file a 990 as a as a nonprofit or a foundation or a corporation, uh, you can look that up. So you guys can go online and look up any foundation's 990 and see, oh gosh, well here are their assets. But you can also get an idea of what their mission is. So this particular foundation, while yes, they did have a ton of money, their mission was serving teenage unwed moms. And I think I can sell Main Street to anybody, but that one was a little tougher for me. So I went, you know what? I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get that one. I, I think I need to, we need to focus our energy on the ones who we have a mission match with. So when, the, when I talk about mission match, I want to make sure I make that clear. Uh, that's what that means. You have to make sure that what you do falls within the realm of what they want to fund. And once you get that match in, it's easier to keep them long-term. So there you go. Do you have any questions for me? Yes, we do have quite a few questions that have come in, so I think we'll keep you busy for a little bit. Uh, one question. Uh, don't these higher tax districts discourage new businesses in the area? Not if you have the, um, I guess my response back to that question would be, when you build a lifestyle center or the new malls, do you think those are at a higher taxing level? Trust me, they are. And does it really discourage investment in that area? No. So it's all about what is the long-term return on that investment. So frankly, you shouldn't put a higher tax on a district that's already failing and struggling. But if you're having a successful district, I, I wouldn't say there'd be big issues with that. Okay, another question. We have donors that give to specific programs like beautification. How do we transition those folks over to general fund givers? I think that's where your work plans come into effect and really help you understand how to sell your entire program. So it's kind of a, you like chocolate? You're gonna love chocolate and vanilla together. So think about how you can add that flavor back into it. I have a program here in Alabama. It's, it's one of the most brilliant ways of 
of talking about what their program does. They do their board retreat, they do their goal setting, they put everything on the uh, foam core boards in a beautiful, and those are pretty cheap, guys. They have a, we're gonna, a business membership breakfast and they celebrate and they have all these things out with projects on them. So they're already talking at this breakfast, not asking anybody for money, but they're already talking about what they're gonna do. And I've been invited to that a couple of times going, that's a pretty smart way to visually communicate what you're doing and that you're more than beautification. So I would educate, educate, educate on that one. That's a great answer. Frank from our staff suggests you could have had a teen mom downtown fest. You missed an opportunity <laughs> there. Uh, oh my gosh, that's funny. Um, okay. Well, I'll give you the foundation. Oh, that <laughs> and thank you for reinforcing work plans. All you people out there, we're telling you all the time how important those work plans are. Fundraising is it. They do not see work plans come up when people come asking for money. Um, yeah. Another question. This is going back to the 501c3. What is the caution of membership campaigns in 501c3 organizations? A 501c3 is typically philanthropic or educational in nature. That's what allows you to have that 501c3. Um, and, and, you know, the IRS doesn't give out 501c3s like candy like they used to. So they're really looking at, so if you're running your organization as an economic development entity through a 501c3 and you file your taxes and you have to put all the different things that you're doing, it can get flagged. So that's why I, but there are some foundations who just want to give to a C3. So that's why I recommend a companion friends of um, the organization, but running the organization itself through a C6, because at the heart of what we do, we're economic development. We're not just philanthropic and we're not just educational. Main Street is more than that. Okay, we have another question about uh, the EDA grant. Mm -hmm. People want to know if that's an opportunity. Uh, this one was a statewide, uh, it kind of depends on what happens at the federal level if more EDA money is going to be coming through the CARES Act. I don't know of any local program getting EDA money that I'm aware of, Joyce, you may know. My intention with the money that we're getting is to provide services and actual physical things like foot door poles and uh, a graphics package and, and a little money toward uh, businesses being able to set up an online sale. That's what we're doing with our EDA grant as we go in and help them. Okay, how do we figure out business going forward? Because the pandemic is going to end. We may get who knows when, but business probably isn't going to change. I mean, you're still going to want people are still going to want curbside delivery. They're still going to want, you know, being able to order online. Some of the things that you've seen change with this pandemic are going to be carried forth with us for a long time. So I haven't really seen many local programs being able to to access that. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's it's very, very complicated when you have a federal grant. And that is another thing. Think about the administration side of the grant compared to what you're going to be able to do with it, because federal grants are ridiculously hard to administer. Um, that's my opinion and then it's thank, frankly too true. So if you're going to start pursuing like a USDA or CDBG or anything like that, you really need to get a grant writer who's going to help you administer the grant afterwards too. Okay, we have a multi-part question which I'm going to try to break up into sections and hopefully keep it making sense. How do you recommend best organizing various fundraising efforts across Main Street committees? For example, public art letter campaign, holiday decor digital sponsorship campaign, Giving Tuesday, year-end giving. When is it too much? How do you coordinate the channels? I'm gonna have to go back to work plans. Uh, if you're doing a public art campaign, and that is something that falls underneath the design committee, when they do their work plan, they should pull together a budget, but they're also gonna have to research sources of funding along with it. So for me, if you're looking at public art, that would be something that, okay, we're looking at this overall campaign, that piece needs to come here and it'll get funded, but we need to figure out what are the sources thereof. Does that answer that question? It goes back to work planning. Okay, that's great. 
That's good. And then training people. And that's the the second half of that question was, what are the best tools to ensure your board can wrap their heads around the various giving campaigns? What I used to do when I was a local Main Street director, we would have our annual board retreat, and that's when the board would set the goals and just overarching goals. The board doesn't have to like micromanage, and then those goals would go to the committees, and we try to get anywhere from five to eight. 10 tops work plans for each committee uh, but then the, all that had to come back to the board so they looked at it all at one time so they're seeing 50 different ideas or 40 or whatever whatever the number ended up but along with that was okay we want to do this this event but we think it's going to cost us fifteen thousand dollars so the chairs of the committees and myself as staff would sit down and go, okay, this is, I love this idea, this is cool, how are we gonna fund this puppy? And some of that came from the general fund, but sometimes the idea was just so cool, we had to figure out, this is a one, one shot deal, we're gonna do seasonal banners in our downtown district, we're gonna have them made by a local artist, which we actually did do this project, but it was gonna cost us $30,000. Well, I didn't have 30,000 extra dollars floating around in my budget. So we had to figure out, what are some sources of funding for this and we broke it down into like three different categories we went to a foundation that supported the arts and got 10 from them we went to the city because it was all going to be city oriented and, and quality of life in the city we got 15 from them so now we're at 25,000. i only had to figure out five thousand dollars worth of fundraisers for these and that was a piece of cake so we really had to break out how we were going to fund it back to work plans Okay, we have a little lag in the questions now. Well, please give people uh, their typing fingers a few minutes to get their questions in. But it is, it, you know, looking at all the funnels. So I'm looking at, while well, we have a lag, I'll just pull out some of this stuff. So our buckets are typically, are typically foundations, state and federal, corporations, and individuals. So those are kind of the, the overall areas that we look and we go, okay, who are our corporate partners? And sometimes they have, uh, they'll give through the corporate or they'll give through their foundation. And then when we looked at, uh, you know what we've started to see while there's a lag, this is something for you guys to think about. We have in Alabama resource conservation and development councils in every one of our, you know, there's one for all the whole state. And they are working with us right now to pay for the hand sanitizing stations that we're buying for all of our communities. So you have to look and see what's out there and what they're interested in doing. But you'll be surprised at what, for Alabama Power, for instance, they give through the company and they also give through the foundation, if that helps. So corporate, state and federal, that gets into your grant pieces, uh, foundations and individuals for kind of, and for for local Main Street programs, that would be your downtown merchants, your city, you know, take it to your, always always take a great idea and then scale up or scale down depending on the size of your, your community. I have a, a question that I can ask while we're waiting for more people to type questions in. Um, we have, it's always a challenge when you have a Main Street board uh, to keep the fundraising centralized out of the organization committee with the board rather than the design committee fundraising for everything independently, mm -hmm. the promotions committee getting sponsorship independently. How do you recommend that coordination of all of the fundraising activities across the various committees again? Again, just going back to the work plans. This is what you say you're gonna do through the year. This is, what, this is what we've approved. This is the budget that we've approved. Now, promotion committee, your special event, you're saying the gate is gonna bring in $8,000. The whole thing's gonna cost us 10. So what we're providing you for your general fund is 2,000. Now for a promotion event in particular, um, I never per, per, uh, did a event that wasn't paid for before it started. So you you want your gate, if you're gonna have a gated ticketed event, you want that to be gravy. So you wanna have as much paid for in advance. So you don't wanna rely overly on a whole bunch of people come to an event and not have many show up and then you're stuck with a big bill. 
So that was always our goal, something our, our board kind of pulled together saying, if you're going to have a special event and it's going to cost you this much, your gate cannot be part of that. <laughs> your gate needs to be the gravy. And then sometimes that would carry over to the next year. Okay, we have another question that came in. Have you established any finance funds for development in opportunity zones? Yes. Uh, we have uh, Opportunity Alabama was one of the first, uh, Alabama was one of the first states to get into the whole Opportunity Zone piece. I would encourage you to look at Opportunity Alabama, and this is another thing that know what your limitations are. That is very complicated. That is like legally stuff. And I rely on Alex with Opportunity Alabama to coordinate that for us. Uh, he happens to be on our board, but he's he's been able to coordinate two or three projects, big projects in our communities through Opportunity Zones as it relates to the Main Street program. And for any of you out there, if you're in um, if you're in Appalachia, ARC, the Appalachia Regional Commission has great planning grants to help uh, get projects off the ground. That's in Appalachia counties. Uh, Francis Joe Hamilton is with me. I love Mary. Work plans, work plans, work plans. That is the <laughs> hey, answer Francis. to everything. Joe's That's what quoting Joe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just, you know, it's your agenda for the whole year. And I was, you know, when I was a local Main Street director, and Joyce, you, you may or may not remember Jean Stinson, who was the state coordinator in Kansas uh, back in the day, but I was I was one of her problem children. And I, Jean, <laughs> I know what I'm doing. She goes, Mary, give me your work plan. I was like, I know what I'm doing. And I'll never forget her sitting across the, the desk for me, trying to, you know, trying to convince me work plans were a good thing. And she goes, what if you get hit by a bus? I'm going, well, that's harsh. She goes, no, seriously. What if something happens to you tomorrow? Who's going to pick this up? And I went, oh, and that's when, you know, she, that's exactly right. And for me, I think the biggest thing that freaked me out over work plans is, at least when we had them in Kansas, is you had your, your, your goal that the board set, kind of this is what we expect measurability and this is the activity. I had to figure those out. And I was looking at, okay, I've got four committees, average of 10 work plans per committees. I got to come up with 40 goals. It freaked me out. I just couldn't do it until it really, and Jean, bless her heart, she was so patient with me. She goes, Mary, it's just overarching goals that the board gives you, and then you come down from that. And I'm going, oh, well, that makes it easier because I was trying to think of 10 different ways to say one thing because I thought I had to have an individual for each of my work plans, and you don't. So the board's goal is to give you those broad ideas, and then the com the committees figure out what the um activities are under each one and that's when the light bulb went off for me and we got them that's all done and then we were able to use that work plan as our agenda for every meeting through the rest of the year it's like oh this is a thousand times better that's right that's exactly right figuring out how those activities achieve the overall arching goals and that's it right? exactly and the hardest thing you know nothing irritates me more when I'm asked to, to serve on something and you, everybody's experienced it, you, you sit down, you're going, okay, I'm excited about this. I can't wait. I'm going to be on this committee. And you sit there and they all look at each other going, what are we supposed to do? Oh, we do. We don't know what to do. And I will give you two meetings like that. And then Mary out, I'm done. Um, and think about your volunteers. Having a work plan that says, this is what we're doing the entire year. You're going to get more volunteers in and you're going to get more money in because you know what the heck you're doing. So yeah, I'm a Jean Stinson, bless her heart and rest, rest her soul, um, beat it into my head and I thank her every day for that. Okay, we did have another question come in. As a follow-up to the question regarding event fundraising, should they be requesting for individual events or reach out for sponsors of the program organization as a whole? You know, there's there's a couple of different ways to look at that, and, and you really got to figure out the personality of your community. In some cases, you can package all of that into one and say, here is the list of sponsorship opportunities through the year. And I've seen some communities be wildly successful at that, going, please don't come back to me eight times. Just tell me everything you need money for and let me pick. So that works out really well for some communities. Other communities are going, I don't even know what I'm going to have next quarter. So come to me each quarter. Um, so I would line it out, everything that you're going to need for the year, and then try to match as much as you can 
the most appropriate sponsor for the event that you're doing. So we did an event in Emporia called Dog Days of Summer, which is all wrapped around um, dogs, obviously, and some other things. But we did because we had three dog food plants in Emporia and they would sponsor the entire thing. And it really was more of a community event for us that we eventually, frankly, turned over to the um, Humane Society because it was a better fit for them. And we ended up just being a partner alongside because it was less work and it made more sense for them. But we, it, but we had a great match between the industry that we had in Emporia with that particular event. That leads me to another question to fill in that I think didn't really get hit very hard, but partnerships, when you partner with other organizations, mm -hmm. they become co-fundraisers with you and you don't have to do everything yourself necessarily. Do you have some examples of partnerships like that? Dog Days of Summer, I think. Dog Days of Summer was one, but I, I'm gonna caution on that a little bit that you need to have an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding in place before the money comes in. Um, that says, okay, we're agreeing before everybody's mad, let's agree that this is what we're going to do. Uh, and we have a sample MOU that we do, and fr frankly, we do it in communities that have, the Main Street program may be housed within the city, but they have a volunteer board. We're trying to figure out how are we all going to play nice together? Or in one of my communities, they had a merchants association that was bringing in memberships, and they said, we're going to give this much of the membership to the Main Street organization. So you just need to have that, this is, before everybody's mad, have your, this is the intent, this is who's doing what, this is your responsibilities, um, have it sign off on a memorandum of understanding. So yes, I would highly encourage um, talking all of that out ahead of time instead of just assuming we're gonna split the profits afterwards, but only one organization gets to count the money. Mm, that's not smart. So, excellent, so. excellent suggestions. Yeah, both need to be involved. Okay, well, I says we don't have any more questions now and we're really two minutes from our end time. That's excellent. Mary, thank you so much for presenting to us. Again, the handout, the presentation is in the handout box there. It'll be two or three hours and go to meeting. We'll send you a link to this webinar. And uh, this is our fourth and final revitalization series training for 2020. Yay. And uh, we, uh, Francis Joe, is working on the calendar for 2021. And we'll be letting you all know what our revitalization series will be for next year. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Mary. Take care. Bye.